And if you weren't here this morning, preach a sermon on the, the Bible, many Bible prophecies have been fulfilled, uh, mostly in the Old Testament. And tonight we're going to be dealing with supposed contradictions in the Bible. Now, obviously, the, you know, we're kind of, I'm kind of using two approaches to convince and to combat the naysayers. All right. So there's a lot of people that will say, why do you have faith in the Bible? Things like that. Well, this morning we went through a lot of biblical prophecy, things that have come to pass. So, you know, all, these, all these various reasons why it's reasonable to believe this is God's word. So that was this morning. This evening, now, it's going to be, I, I actually, I went to a website where, and, and there's so many of these out there. There's, there's a lot of this stuff on the internet. You'll have atheists and, and just random groups of people who want to attack the Bible and, and attack the, the um, you know, if God truly did preserve his word. We're a King James only church. We believe that God preserved his word. He has it for us today even in the English language, and it's found in the King James Bible, and this is what we believe and teach, and if it's God's word, it's going to be perfect, there's going to be no errors, there's going to be no contradictions, otherwise it's not from God, because God is a perfect God, God is not imperfect, so it's either his word or it's not. And um, I've done many sermons in the past where, we've, where I've gone through the various false versions of the Bible and exposed you know, all the differences and how they have contradictions and stuff like that. So I went... And I want to cover and answer, and it's only a handful, mind you. There, I know that there are many people out there that have all these different issues that they want to nitpick and, and, and point at and say, here's a contradiction, here's a contradiction. Now, I don't, I don't shy away from this at all. In fact, you know, prior to preaching a sermon, in, in years, just in my years of being saved, I actually kind of enjoy the challenge of saying, Where's the errors in the Bible? Point them out to me. I like to see that. I want to know what you think is wrong in the, in the Scripture. Like if, if someone's going to come at me and say, hey, what about this in the Bible? Because what I believe is based on Scripture. What I believe is based on this book. So if you're going to show me there's a problem here, I'm not going to back away from it. Sure, let's look at it. Now, I don't claim, and I won't ever claim this, to have all of the answers. There are things that are mysteries to me in the Bible that I don't fully understand, okay? And I'll be honest with you about that. And every single criticism or critique that someone might come up with, I'm also not claiming to have every single answer to every question of someone that says, why is this in here? This looks like a contradiction, okay? But I've dealt with these long enough. And I, did, I didn't cherry pick either, by the way. I have all 12 points that this, that this one website put out, okay? And uh, I don't remember, I didn't write down the name of the website. I still got it up in the office. So if you're interested in it, you know, whatever. I could, I could post it for you, I could show it to you. But um, I have all of these things and I wanted to attack them. And there's actually, there were a few, a few new ones that I hadn't seen before. I mean, some of them, oh yeah, I've seen this before. Okay, I've seen this before, I've seen this before. And I studied up on it and kind of tried to figure it out. But there's some that, uh, that were new, and I enjoyed going through this. So it was something that was enjoyable for me. But we're starting off here in the book of Mark, and of course, this is the account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So the very first thing that's mentioned is, when was Jesus Christ crucified? And what the, the website's claiming is that there are two different times given in the gospel accounts of when Jesus Christ was crucified. So we see here very clearly in Mark 15, verse number 25, the Bible says, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. Now, the, the, the way that the, the, the hours were, were timed, how, how they did their timing then was uh, basically sunrise to sunset. So you got the third hour of the day, you know, roughly 6 a.m. would be the sunrise, so the third hour would be around 9 a.m., you know, the, the sixth hour would be around noon, ninth hour would be around three, right? And the twelfth hour is, is, is the full day, the sunset. So that's the way that they did. Just, just kind of keep this understanding as we're reading this. And the supposed contradiction, well, let's, first we're going to go through these accounts. So um, let's reread here, starting in Mark 15, verse number 22. It says, And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine, mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Jump down to verse number 32. 
The Bible reads, Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And I, and I want to point this out because we're going to look at a couple of other accounts from the other Gospels. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 27. Just to see the consistency first before I point out where the supposed contradiction is. I want you to see all of the things that, that you know, okay, this matches up, this matches up, this matches up, and then we're going to look at the one that supposedly is a contradiction. So third hour in Mark 15, he's crucified. From the sixth hour to ninth hour, there's darkness. Makes sense, right? Matthew 27, look at verse number 45. Bible reads, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? So again, matches up just fine with what we saw in Mark 15 regarding the darkening uh, between the sixth and the ninth hour. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. And forgive me, I'm going to go pretty quick tonight, so try to keep up. Um, if you're having a hard time keeping up, just listen. Maybe write down a note of the, of the references and look them up later. I have a lot of material, and, and, and I honestly don't know if I'm going to get through all the 12 um, supposed contradictions. We'll see where we're at with time. So, um, but I'm going to try to be as, as quick as I can about going through this. Luke 23. There's some time in the way. Oh, yeah, well... <laughs> We've got, we've, got some, we've, we've got some time here. So Luke 23, verse number 43, we're going to see here, the Bible reads, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. So we see Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have that uh, recording of the sixth hour to the ninth hour, but they don't have the time listed of when they actually crucified him. So he was all, we know he was already up on the cross by the sixth hour to the ninth hour because the darkness came and it's all in agreement, every single one. Now, um, turn if you would to John 19 because this is where the supposed contradiction is found. John 19, we're going to start reading in verse number 13. By reason, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. So the problem's coming in here. You can see it hopefully right away that they're saying, Oh, well, was he crucified at the third hour? Or was he crucified at the sixth hour? Because the Bible says right there in, in verse 14, and it was a preparation of Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. The problem is, it doesn't say it was about the sixth hour of the day. So is the phrase about the sixth hour referring to the time of day or not? And I think very clearly the answer is no. When you remember that Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night, the night before, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, right? And he was praying real late. It was real late at night, so much as that they couldn't keep their eyes open. Right? They weren't able to stay awake. After he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was brought before the high priest first, where they found him guilty. Then, because they couldn't put him to death, they had to bring him to Pilate. So then he stands before Pilate. Then Pilate, he understands he's under jurisdiction of Herod. He's like, oh, I'm going to send you over to Herod. So then Herod sees him, and then Herod sends him back over to Pilate again before Pilate finally, ultimately, has his hands forced to, to pronounce judgment against him. If he was crucified at what we would consider 9 a.m. or the third hour of the day, it makes perfect sense because the sixth hour... In John 19 is literally the sixth hour from his arrest around 3 a.m. when they got him in the garden. He has been going through this ordeal for six hours of him standing before these judges. And then it says, at about the sixth hour, he saith unto the Jews, behold your king. 
He's been going through this the whole time. It do, mind you, it doesn't say the sixth hour of the day. It's the sixth hour from something. And the sixth hour from something is the sixth hour that he has been um, arrested from. And, and, and you could get that clearly from the context that these events that were taking place would all fit within that six hour time frame. So, and, and let me point this out too. Now, I'm answering critics of people who say the Bible's not true, not, you cannot say it's 100% true, you can't say it's not accurate. There's some errors there. I am not saying that my answers are always going to be exactly the right answers. But my answers that I'm giving, I think, are extremely reasonable to say that you can't just call this a contradiction, just un irrefutable, without a doubt, this is an error and this is a problem. Okay, there's, there's two different ways of approaching it. And what I've found with people is if you don't want to believe the Bible, either because you don't like what it says or for whatever reason, you'll be able to find reasons why you don't want to believe the Bible. It's just, I mean, that's just the way it is. People are going to you're going to accept it or reject it. We accept God's word on faith. But as I mentioned this morning, it's not just this blind faith. Okay, the Bible's been proven true to me over and over and over and over and over again. Even things where I haven't understood them, things where I just, I couldn't get the meaning, other things maybe I stumbled on, I didn't get it. Later on, it's revealed, oh, that's what that means. I just wasn't comprehending it properly. I just didn't quite have a full understanding of it. When we look at these things, and again, they're, they're always brought, usually they're brought up in a way to get your mind working on a certain path already of there being a contradiction without just looking at it honestly and trying to figure out what it all means. So in this situation, I see zero problem with it saying the sixth hour because it very clearly appears to be six hours of the day or of, of the time that's from the time he was arrested. Let's look at our, our next example in 2 Kings chapter 24. Turn if you to 2 Kings chapter 24. And this is, there's actually many supposed contradictions found in the books of the Kings and Chronicles. And they have to do with, with ages and years and dates and stuff like that. And, um, I, you know, thankfully, this, this only had a couple of them. There's not too many of them. Those are, honestly, there's kind of the same answer for, for many of them. But we're going we're gonna to look at this one. We're going to read it and see what this says. So in 2 Kings chapter 20, and by the way, I, like I said, this is not my, like my reasons that I'm giving is what I think, but I've heard in, in many of these other examples, people who say other things that they think, no, this is actually what that means. And I'm not saying, you know, and, and these aren't things I'm necessarily going to be super dogmatic on. The whole point is just to show that you can't just say inherently this is a contradiction, that this is just a false and a problem with the, the translation or with the Bible. 2 Kings 24, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And um, what they're comparing this with is the account in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. So we see Jehoiakim, 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 9 says, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Now, one of the, the examples that we could give here, well, one of the, re the reason why you can see different ages like this and they could still both be true without necessarily having a contradiction is that what happened with kingdoms and with kings is that you would have co-regents. You would have someone who is a king simultaneously with the person who's going to be succeeding them. For example, David was king over Jerusalem, over Israel, right? Solely king over Israel for a long time. But before he died, he appointed Solomon to be king. 
And during that time, there's kind of like this, you know, Solomon wasn't at the helm all by himself until David died. Now, that happened really, you know, David's death happened pretty quickly after Solomon was appointed. But there's many cases where you'll have someone being appointed as the, next, as the king and their co-regents together. So when they're actually anointed king and the time they, they get to be king and, and be in full power by themselves, there's different time spans that can cross the gap there. Now, there's other theories for this, this particular uh, passage, but um, you know the co-region thing is not found just in this place alone. There's uh, Joash became king when he was seven, for example. That's when he became king. But the priest Jehoiada was the one that was the acting king up until Joash was able to make the decisions on his own was informally like became the king. But you can say he became king when he was seven or you can say he became king later on when Jehoiada wasn't involved in, in, in helping him make the decisions. You, can, you could use either account and they would be both accurate. They would both be able to describe the event without having one be false. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Get one finger in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and one in chapter 21. 2 Samuel 21. We're going to see a supposed contradiction of um, Michal, David's wife. So um, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 22, the Bible says, And I will be yet more vile than thus, and will be, this is David speaking to Michal, and will be based in mine own sight, and of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall be had in honor. Therefore Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. So right here we're seeing she, she was barren. She had no child under the day of her death because David basically put her away. I mean, he didn't divorce her, but he, he was like, well, I'm not going to have any relations with you anymore. So she had no child under the day of her death. But in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 7, the Bible reads, But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite. So the supposed contradiction is, well, wait a minute. In this place, it says that Michal had no child under the day of her death. And over here, it says she had five sons. That were, that were basically executed to, to satisfy um, um, another problem. But first of all, you have to understand, there, there's, there's multiple explanations for this. And the one that I believe is that you got to read, and in all these situations, you have to read very, very carefully. You have to read, I mean, each word matters. In that 2 Samuel 21, it says, the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite. Now, when David was off on his own, when David had, had had to escape and flee because Saul was after him to put him to death, Saul had given Michal to another man to be his wife. And this was obviously not right. It was not a righteous thing to do. But it's very possible, and what I believe is that Adriel, the, the man's wife she became, was a widower himself who already had five children. And that's why it says she brought up for Adriel these five sons because he had children and he, she became his wife. So she raised them up to, um, as, as, her mo as their mother, even though she didn't physically give birth to them. Now, the other way you could look at this too is that when this happened with, with Michal, with the daughter of Saul, when she was given to the other man, that was before David ever even came back in the kingdom, and that was before all of these events happened with David and Michal when, uh, when David kind of put her away. So when it says here, therefore, Michal the daughter of Saul had no children under the day of her death, that could be referring to no child with David. That could be referring to they didn't have any kids together, you know, not that she didn't have any from her previous. So you can see how there's very, very, very reasonable explanations on how 
there is no contradiction here. And like I said, I'm not saying that, that I just am going to dogmatically prove this is the only way, the right answer. No. The point is to say there's not a contradiction. You can't just say this is definitely a contradiction in the Bible. It's not an error because there's many reasonable explanations that you can give for this to happen the way it's gone down with, with both statements being true. You're in 2 Samuel. Look at chapter number 8. 2 Samuel 8, and we're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 18. Now, we also need to keep in mind, just as there's four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all truthful, but they're different accounts of what happened. So, the authors, the, the, the writers, are, are writing down the Word of God, they're writing down the truth, but from slightly different perspectives, and some are, are including different facts that others don't include. So it does, again, it doesn't make any of them false. They're all true, but just because someone leaves some information out that another one has in there, there's not a contradiction there. Right. It's the same thing when we look at, you know, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings versus the Chronicles. They're different sources. They're not, they're not the same you know, author or writer writing these things down. So many times you're going to have very, 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 very close, even exact same wording in many cases when you kind of put the parallel passages up. But it's still taken from different perspectives. So keep that in mind. We're going to look at these two examples here. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. The Bible reads, David smote also... Hadad-Ezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him, and this is where the contradiction is, so pay attention to the numbers. And David took from him a thousand chariots and 700 horsemen and 20,000 footmen. And David hawked all the chariot horses, but reserved of them four and hundred chariots. Now in 1 Chronicles 18, this event or these events, the, the recording here of, the, of, of what's looked at as a parallel passage. Verse 3 says in 1 Chronicles 18, And David smote Hadarezer, king of Zobah, unto Hamath, as he went to establish his dominion by the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven thousand horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. David also hawked the, all the chariot horses, but reserved of them in 100 chariots. So the differences there between verses 4 and each one is one of them says 700 horsemen, the other one says 7,000 horsemen. So you say, well, which one is it? And people say, well, it's a scribal error, you know, they meant to put a zero there. No. There's no scribal error. There's no, there's no error in, in what was recorded here. Again, let's read very carefully what the words are saying in the scriptures. In the second Samuel account, it says in verse 3, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates, and verse 3 in the other account, 1 Chronicles 18, says as he went to establish. Establishing and then recovering are two different things. So what could happen here, and this is why I mentioned that there's two different accounts. One could be referring to the major battle, right, where, where the most was done. The recovery then could add the, the or, or have an extra, you know, 700 horse, you know, backup or reserves were sent later to try to, you know, from, from the other army to, to try to recover what they were doing and lost those as well. So the one can be for the battle while the other total is for the whole, for the whole uh, campaign, right? So w w in, in battle, in war, you have military battles. It's, it, usually, you'll find throughout history, you'll have these big battles, right? One big day, there was this huge battle, the Battle of the Bulge, the Battle, you know, famous battles. But that doesn't mean that's the whole war, or even when you're taking a city or something like that, there's other skirmishes, there's other things that go on, there's counterattacks, and you can give the account for one battle, or you could give the account for the entire, you know, I'll use the word campaign, if you will. And neither one means that there's a contradiction. 
It just means that it's, it's a different perspective of timing and when this happened and, and how many they had, um, they had taken. Another interesting note here, because that's, that's one possibility. Or, and this is something that, that I heard from, from some, you know, I, I read this somewhere else, it could be that there were 20,000 men taken, of which either 700 or 7,000 were horsemen. So like the 20,000 footmen is the total. But you could be a footman and a horseman essentially at the same time. So what they're saying is that you could use these numbers, whereas the, the horsemen are a subset of the total troops. And this is another you know, reasonable answer. So depending on when they were counted before or after David Huck the horses, because he only kept one-tenth of the chariot horses. So he got a thousand chariots, but he kept a hundred chariots. So you don't need as many horsemen when you only have a hundred versus when you have a thousand. And since he kept one-tenth, well, if there were 7,000 horsemen when there was 1,000 chariots, he only kept one-tenth of that, then that would leave 700 horsemen for the 100 chariots that were left over that he brought back. So the, the numbers, you know, you can't say that there's, an, again, an inherent contradiction there, that it has to be one or the other, because there's very reasonable explanations based on the perspective of the person who's writing down the Word of God here. Now turn, if you would, to Genesis 32. We're going to go to our next example here. Genesis 32, and we're also going to go to John chapter 1. Genesis 32 and John chapter 1. Genesis 32 is the account when Jacob was wrestling all night with the angel. Remember that? And then, and then he, uh, his thigh went out of joint, but he still didn't give in and, and the, that whole thing, you know. And um, what he says here, we're going to start reading in verse number 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Verse 30, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And what they're saying, the contradiction there is with John chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So they're saying, oh, well, he says he saw God face to face. But then in John 1, he's saying, well, no man's seen God at any time. So, you know, there's a contradiction. Well, again, not at all. John, in the book of John, is referring to God the Father. We know that there is a Holy Trinity. We know that, that there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We know that these three are one. We know that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He was God incarnate. So there were a lot of people that saw Jesus when he was walking around on this earth and in the flesh who saw one of the, the aspects of God, one of the manifestations of God, one part of the Godhead. But it's still true that no one has seen God the Father, which is in heaven. Now, what I believe is that every physical manifestation of God was basically an appearance of Jesus Christ. I think there's many, you know, a few uh, appearances that Jesus Christ made in the Old Testament. For example, Melchizedek, when he came from the, when Abraham came from the slaughter of, of, uh, of um, when he got, when he retrieved Lot back and met with Melchizedek and, you know, gave him a tithe, he gave him a tenth of the spoils, and Melchizedek is referred to back in Hebrews as basically Jesus Christ. He's the high priest, without father, without mother, um, without beginning of days and end of life. So, um, you know, we see this multiple times. I believe that's the same situation here with Jacob when it says that um, he's had power with man and with God, and he said, I've seen God face to face because he saw Jesus Christ, but not God the Father. So again, it's a lack of understanding of the, of the doctrines of, of the Trinity. So no contradiction there. Let's look at James chapter 1. Actually, stay in, keep a finger in Genesis. We're going to go to Genesis 22. 
in James chapter 1. We're going to look at another supposed contradiction. So I'm going to be trying to go pretty fast tonight, but try to, try to stick with it. Try to, try to keep up with, with what I'm saying here and, you know, so you can understand what the one side saying, the people who want to attack the, the, the truth of the Bible, and then how it can easily be answered with a reasonable, you know, look, we're not grasping at straw. I don't think so, at least. I, I, I find myself to be a rather reasonable person. I don't think that, that I'm just trying to find anything to just make sure that my faith isn't crushed in the Bible, because that's another comment that, that people will make. Oh, you just want to believe that's so bad that you'll just grab at anything to make it to make it work. But that's not, I mean, I think these all are making some pretty good sense. I, I think it's a relatively good answer for these supposed contradictions. Genesis 22 and James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 13. James 1, 13 reads, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. So mind you, the context here that we're reading in James chapter 1, he says, No man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And the context is with evil. Okay, he's not, he's not, God is not trying to get you to sin. That's what this chapter is saying. It's very clear. James chapter 1. Genesis chapter 22, however, the Bible says in verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now, the word tempt just means he's testing them, right? Now, we're tested when, well, whether we're going to do right or wrong all the time. And when you're confronted with some kind of a sin, that could be considered a temptation or a test also is, are you going to do what's right or are you going to do what's wrong? Okay, it's very, that's why you could call them both temptations. But see, God isn't going to be the one trying to get you to slip up. He's not going to be the one trying to get you to, to get into this sin and try to tempt you in that way. He may allow temptations to happen and he may tempt you to see, is your faith fully in him? which is what he was doing with Abraham. He was tempting him in that regard, but he wasn't tempting him with evil to sin like Satan does. So again, hence, no contradiction. Just because the Bible says that God cannot be tempted, neither tempteth he any man, and then he said God tempted Abraham, the context clears up that situation perfectly, that God's not using evil to tempt people with sin. Uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to also look at Luke chapter number 3. I'm not going to go very much in depth into this. You can very easily probably preach an entire sermon out of this supposed contradiction. Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, if you don't already know where I'm going with this, has to do with the genealogy accounts. Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. So if you've ever read it and you kind of compared it, you'll see, wait a minute, these don't line up. There's, there's some differences here. There's different names mentioned here. So there's, there's, we're, we're going to look at this, though, a little, just real briefly what they're saying, because it's not just regarding all the names. Okay, that's not what, the, what the, the case is. Matthew chapter 1 verse 16 says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And then in Luke 3.23, the Bible reads, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. So they're saying, well, in Matthew 1, Jacob begat Joseph. So the, the, the contradiction that they're saying here is, who is Joseph's father? That's what they're trying to say. Like, well, it says Jacob begat Joseph, but then in Luke chapter 3, it says that Joseph was the son of Heli. The first thing I want to point out is that there is a big difference between begat and being the son of. And when you're looking through the various um, genealogies, when you're looking at the various, um, just all the different names, you go through Chronicles and you see people were born to this. There are people who are skipped. There are names who are skipped. And, and very oftentimes, people are referred to the son of 
without being the literal, physical, first direct descendant of somebody. So many times we are referred to as the son of David, right? Meaning that David was their ancestor somewhere back along the line, not meaning he physically was the direct father of that person. Now, begat, on the other hand, does have more of that connotation of, hey, this person begat this person, which is more of a physical begetting of that person. So um, without going more in depth in this, because we could, um, I just want to point that out there in this case. You can be an adopted son and be called a son, right? You could be the son of. You can also have maybe a father-in-law and be their son, right? So as many people think, if between Matthew and Luke, if that one is a genealogy of the physical Mary side, where because Jesus was physically born of a human being, of a woman, that you can trace her descendancy back to David and back to God. And the other one being the supposed father, being Joseph, tracing his line back to be a kingly line also. So both ways you can, you can make it work and make the argument, make the case that Jesus Christ is the rightful heir to the throne according to prophecy, according to scripture. So being a son of versus begat, very important words. The Bible doesn't just, didn't decide to use one versus the other. They're there on purpose. There's a very good reason for it. So when you see that right away, we need to be thinking, why does it say that? And, and you can use this to not say, oh, well, there's just automatically a contradiction there. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And this is pretty easy. I actually, I don't even have any, I don't even have any notes or extra scriptural references in here to like, to, to answer this one. They gave me a freebie when, when, you know, some of them actually made me think a little bit, but, but a few of them were just like, this is a total lack of understanding. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Right? And then in Genesis 5, 5, it says, And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years old, and he died. So... This boils down to just the basic lack of understanding that it's not talking about a physical death, but a spiritual death. All throughout Scripture, we know that you know, we need to be born again. We see that you know, the Apostle Paul wrote, um, you know, I was alive once without the law, but then sin came and, you know, and, and uh, or the sin revived and, and I died. And, you know, like, and I know I'm totally butchering that, that verse. Forgive me for that. But when we sin, we die spiritually. But it's not a physical death. The physical death comes later. And what God was talking about, he did, Adam did surely die in that day. And that's why he needed forgiveness. That's why he needed atonement. That's why he needed to be born again. So um, that, is that is not a contradiction. That is just simply a lack of understanding what death is talking about. Because there's more than one death. The Bible talks about a second death. About, you, know, there, there's, you, you can't just take that word and say, oh, contradiction. Let's move on to the next one. That one's pretty simple. 1 Samuel chapter 31. 1 Samuel chapter 31 and 2 Samuel chapter 21. Those are the two we're going to be comparing. 1 Samuel 31, 2 Samuel 21. And this is in reference to Saul's death at that, that last battle of his where his sons, he and his sons died against the Philistines. 1 Samuel 31, 2 Samuel 21. So in 1 Samuel 31, I'm going to start reading in verse number 3. The Bible says, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. So there we see Saul received, a, a, I believe, a mortal wound. 
He received a wound, but it was going to take a while for him to die. He didn't want the Philistines to come and abuse him and do whatever to him because he was a king and he was, he was wounded too bad. And he just said, I just want my life ended. He talks to his armorer saying, you know, you just kill me right now because I'm going to die anyways and I don't want to do it before they come here. Armor bearer wouldn't do it. I'm not going to lift up my hands to the Lord's anointed. So Saul decides to take his own life, falls on his sword, and he dies. That's what happened. Second Samuel 21. Here's the supposed contradiction, right? And that's pretty clear. There's no problem with that. That's what the story says. Second Samuel 21, verse number 12. Bible says, And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. So now you're seeing, well, wait a minute, I thought Saul killed himself. Now the Bible's saying that the Philistines killed Saul. Well, that's just going back to who is responsible for the death, right? And we see in other places in Scripture where more than one person can be put responsible for the death of somebody. We saw that with uh, the first thing that came to my mind when I was thinking about this, when they're saying, oh, you're really going to you know, nitpick at that and say that's a contradiction? Because that's all it is. Again, mind you, the people that want to find a contradiction, an error in the Bible, they're going to find these things like this that says, oh, well, I thought that's all killed himself and now the Philistines did it. You know, it's like, well, what about with, um, with Uriah the Hittite? The enemy that they were battling against literally killed him, but you know who was, who was responsible for that? King David was. David was the one that ordered his death. Now, did he physically kill him? No. But would it be wrong to say that David killed him? No, because that's what, that's what God said that David killed him. But is it wrong to say that the enemies killed him? No, because they physically did it. So you can have that cause of, you know, of death on both people. Abimelech was another person. Um, I'll just read this for you. In Judges 9.53, the Bible reads, And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor-bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword, and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. So his, he got too close to the building. This lady throws a big block on his head, right? A big rock, millstone, crushes his head. Now he's worried. He knows he's going to die. It's a mortal wound. He's saying, I don't want people to say that I died. You know, a woman killed me. Okay, I'm in a battle. I don't want to go down as the guy that, that some woman killed. So you kill me so that at least you could say that you killed me. That's his thing, right? But in 2 Samuel 11, Verse 21, the Bible says, uh, you know, they're recalling this story. It says, who smote, Abimelech, who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went you nigh to the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So he's saying, don't you remember when Abimelech went close to the wall and a woman killed him? So his plan didn't work, but did the woman kill him? It's fair enough to say that she did, but you could also say that his buddy did, that, that, that struck him through with the sword. It's the same thing, my, my friends, in, in, with 1 Samuel. No contradiction there. It's just, I mean, <laughs> you're looking for reasons to not believe the Bible when you're pulling this stuff out. Turn, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 25. 2 Kings chapter 25. Another one we have to read very carefully. 2 Kings chapter 25 compared to Jeremiah chapter 52. Second Kings 25, Jeremiah 52. Second Kings 25, verse number 7 is where we're going to start reading. The Bible reads, And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters of brass, and carried him to Babylon. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzar Adan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, 
And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burnt he with fire, and all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now let's look at Jeremiah chapter 52. And, and just so you're aware what the, what the supposed contradiction is, it has to do with the day. So verse 8 says of what we just read in 2 Kings 25, in the fifth month on the seventh day of the month. Okay, keep that in mind. Jeremiah 52, verse 11. Then he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and the king of Babylon, bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon and put him in prison till the day of his death. Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar and captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem. And then it goes on and on, burn the house of the Lord. So we see the same events happening here. So, well, which day was it? The seventh day or the tenth day? Again, every word is important. And, and look, a lot of, I mean, some of you may be sitting there going like, well, I don't know what they, I mean, that looks like a contradiction, right? If you've never seen this before, you've never heard it before, you might be thinking like, well, what, you know, how can that be? We have to read them really close. Now, mind you, look, I studied these out beforehand. Obviously, I'm coming up here prepared. Someone might hit you with one of these one day, and you might not have the answer for them right away. Because sometimes it does require a little bit of work and a little bit of just study, just make sure, what am I missing here? What am I not reading right? Uh, I mean, honestly, I mean, it took me a few hours to prepare this sermon, so it wasn't just, you know, a few of them, yeah, that's easy, I know that, it's not a big deal, or I've seen this before. But some of them, like I said, are, are a little bit more difficult. You have to look at it closely. Well, here's what I found when I looked at this. Verse number 8 in 2 Kings 25, it said, when it gives the seventh day of the month, it says, that's when Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of, of the king of Babylon, came unto Jerusalem. That's when he came unto Jerusalem. Verse number 12 in Jeremiah 52, it says, Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, on the tenth day, is when he came into Jerusalem. So coming unto the city and then actually going into the city, it took three days from the time that he came unto the city before he was able to get into the city. So different accounts, Jeremiah 52, 2 Kings 25, they're looking at it for the you know, This is when he came unto Jerusalem. Not a problem, no contradiction, no error, it's true. Jeremiah 52, this is when he came into the city. No problems. But the people that want to bring up these kind again, they're focused on the numbers and they want to get you focused on the numbers. Right. This one says seven, this one says ten. Can't be right, there's contradiction. And and these other these other uh, modern perversions of the Bible, what they do is they say, I don't know what to do to this. This must not be right. We need to make them both say the same thing. But then you do that and you change it without your understanding that. It's God's word. It was perfect when it was written down. You just keep it the way it is and don't worry about trying to, to fix things that aren't broken. Amen. This isn't broken. Right. They're saying two different things. I got two more examples left. I'm, I'm probably, well, let's do this one first. First Kings chapter 4. First Kings chapter 4, Second Chronicles chapter 9. We've covered this before. I've covered this specifically in a sermon not that long ago. I think when we, when we did 1 Kings chapter 4 in our Wednesday night Bible study. So uh, most of you, if you've been here for that, you've heard this before, but I want to cover it anyways because it was in the list. I didn't want to leave any out. So he had 12 things on this website that, that were supposed contradictions. We've gone through almost all of them. We've got this one and then one more. I'm going to get into the last one, but I'm going to be honest with you. The last one is, I mean, it's fun. It's a puzzle. And I'm not even necessarily fully satisfied with what it means. But I know that the Bible doesn't have errors and contradictions. Amen. It's been proven over and over again. But these things to me are actually fun because it is a puzzle. And, you, and, when, and I like solving these things and you look at it real close. Oh, okay, yeah, unto and into. And you see these other, you know, like, like this, is what, this is why it makes, this is why it fits. This is why it's not a contradiction. And it's great and it's cool. I think it's a lot of fun. But um, so 1 Kings chapter 4 is where I had you turn. But I, and I'm not afraid to pull up something that's a little bit of a stump to me. I'm not afraid to do it. And I have enough confidence. And, and even what I have here, 
Well, I'll, I'll get into that when we get to that. Well, we'll get into that in just a minute. I w let's cover this one first. 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26 says, And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. 2 Chronicles 9, verse 25 says, And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. If you remember when we covered this in our 1 Kings chapter 4 series, having 40,000 stalls for horses is different than having stalls for horses and chariots. Horses and chariots in a stall is different than just a stall for a horse. He had 40,000 stalls for horses. Now, the horses may have been used for his chariots, as it says, stalls of horses for his chariots. But he had stalls ready to go with horses and chariots. I mean, if you have a kingdom and you want to keep a defense... You're going to want to have, we're ready to go. We've got horses lined up, and then he could rotate them. You know, some horses go to the regular stalls. These horses are on the ready. These horses have the chariots. They're hooked up. They're in their stall, and they're ready to go. Some threat comes. We got the chariots, 4,000 stalls ready to go. Not a contradiction. And then at the, at the end of their little website, it says, so much for a perfectly preserved and inspired KJV, just mocking it. Like, we answered all these. There's not a problem. It is perfectly preserved and inspired. There isn't anything wrong with that. But they just came up and, see, I've got all the proof. There you go. What are you going to do with that? Yeah, well, with what they have. Now, in all of these cases, though, and I just want to make this point one, one last time. I'm not claiming that I can prove that my understanding of the scriptures without doubt the correct understanding. Some of them are a little bit more complicated than others. But what I'm demonstrating is that there are very reasonable explanations for these passages that might appear to be contradictions at a glance. But when you look at them more in depth, there are reasonable things that are not, again, not just grasping at any straw just to try to make this work. It makes sense. Any reasonable person could, should be able to, to at least acknowledge that. And if you want to come up with a, with a, a supposed contradiction, then bring one up and, and be able to admit that, yeah, I could see how that could work. I could see how that makes sense. I can see that that's not just, you know, you're not just making stuff up here. The last one, 2 Kings chapter 8 and 2 Chronicles 22. This is interesting. And I'm not done studying this one out. But I wanted to bring it up anyways. It was on the list and I'm not going to avoid it. But this one's interesting. And I had never seen this one before either. So this one, this one took me um, just haven't seen it. So I'm going to be spending more time looking at this one. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26. Or verse 25. Start reading there. In the twelfth year of Joram... The son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Amri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Okay? Okay. Now, what this has to do with is how old Ahaziah was when he began to reign. 2 Chronicles 22. 2 Chronicles 22, verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his stead. For the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the eldest. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Amram. So we see there in verse 2 that he was 42 years old. The other one says he was 22 years old. Now what makes this really interesting is the co-regent doesn't work for this. That's not a reasonable explanation. It doesn't work. The reason why it doesn't work is because, one, and, and you know what, I'm just going to read for you. I found, this, I found this website because I was trying to look and see, well, what are other people saying about this? 
What information is, is out there on this one? I haven't seen this one before, and I was kind of running out of time preparing the sermon. I didn't, you know, I wanted to see what was said. So I found a site, it's called LetGodBeTrue.com. And as I was reading through this, I actually liked their, their attitude on, on dealing with issues. So it says, what do Bible believers do? And I'm just going to read this verbatim. These are not my words. This is what they said. And, and, and I think you'll get a kick out of it. It says, number one, so what do Bible believers do? They humbly trust God over any or all men. They believe both ages are correct and their eyes brighten at discovering God's wisdom hidden from scholars. Number two, they reject any questioning or criticizing of God's word. They study the Bible instead of commentators. They rightly divide the word of truth. Number three, they find that Ahaziah could not have been 42 years old biologically. And this is what's interesting. So in the account where it says he was 42 years old and began to reign, this couldn't have happened biologically because his father was only 40 years old when Ahaziah became king. His dad was only 40 years old. He could not have been 42 years old when he began to reign. Now, 22 works if his dad was 40, right? Because that's 18. He could be 18 and have a child. 18-year-olds these days have children, okay? But... Um, that's, what, that's what it says here. The next one it says, they know a father of 18 is realistic, 40 compared to 22. They know a son being born two years earlier than his father is not realistic. <laughs> Number five, they know Ahaziah was 22 years old biologically when he became king. They know God must be revealing a secret about Ahaziah by the use of 42 in 2 Chronicles 22. So their position of what they're saying here is that this is well known and that God's trying to teach us something by this number. So what does the number mean? And they say, um, the, and again, this, this isn't my position necessarily. This is what I, what I came up with. And I thought this is really interesting because it actually, it gets pretty complicated. It goes in depth. Um, what do Bible believers do? They study the Bible instead of textual critics and they rightly divide the word of truth. Number two, they learn Ahaziah came from Jehoram, a king of Judah and Athaliah, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, Ahab and Jezebel were extremely wicked. Athaliah was their daughter, and that was um, Ahaziah's mom. They know God drowned the earth for such marriages, it says, and they learn God clearly hated this marriage. God didn't like when Jehoshaphat made affinity with Ahab by marrying into his family. That was not something that he was supposed to do. Jehoshaphat was actually a righteous king. He was, he was a good king, but he made a really bad mistake making affinity with the house of Ahab because then his children grew up, screwed up. Ahaziah got, got really screwed up here. So um, just keep that in mind. We haven't gotten to answer the 42 years yet. It says they learned Ahab and Amri were the two most wicked kings to date among the kings of Israel and were utterly abominable. Number four, they learned Ahaziah followed Ahab and Amri more than David for his wicked mother was his counselor and so God had Jehu killed Ahaziah when he was cutting off the house of Ahab. If you remember that story, Jehu went to, to wipe out the house of Ahab and Ahaziah was there and um, he ended up dying also. This provides more of an explanation, which actually makes sense because there isn't a whole lot of explanation given why did Jehu slay Ahaziah? Because God was bringing judgment against Ahab. So we're going to see a little bit more you know, again, more, more involved with this verse, or verse, point number five that they make. They remember that God promised to visit the iniquities of fathers and mothers to the children of the third and fourth generation. Um, <laughs> this one made me laugh. It made me laugh. What do Bible believers do? Number one, they study the Bible instead of fawning over Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, and they rightly divide the word of truth. Number two, they find that Ahaziah, his son Joash, and his son Amaziah were cut out of the lineage of the kings of Judah, leading to Jesus Christ found in Matthew. So these are some of the names that were not mentioned in Matthew. Which, again, then points out another contradiction that, that people don't like when you're going through the genealogy. And they say, oh, well, you skipped some people here. That must not be right. Well, they were skipped for a reason. They were skipped because God didn't even want to mention their names in the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. He didn't want to have, them have anything to do with them because they were so wicked. So in, um, you have Jehoshaphat, you have Jehoram, you have Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah, and Azariah as far as the, the, the kings go in, the, in that order. But in Matthew chapter 1, you have Jehoshaphat and then Joram 
and then it skips all the way down to Uzziah. So it skips Ahaziah, it skips Joash, and it skips Amaziah. It skips those three kings in the lineage of Matthew chapter 1. I'm, we're going somewhere with this, so follow with me, okay? They realize God did not consider Ahaziah a proper king of Judah, Amen. but an imposter from Ahab's line, for the Lord eliminated him and the next two generations from Matthew's genealogy of Jesus Christ. Number four, God hated Amri and Ahab and the wicked affinity that began with Jehoshaphat. Because there were good things in Jehoshaphat, God punished the profane grandson and his sons. So how was Ahaziah 42? How does that work? Ahaziah, king of Judah, here it says, was 42 years old in the kingdom of Amri and Ahab. So what he's claiming, what this person on this website is claiming, that he was 42 years old in the kingdom of Amri and Ahab, the wicked kings of Israel, his maternal family, though only 22 years old biologically. And I'll be honest, this is a little bit of a stretch, but it's really interesting. So Amri reigned for 11 years. Ahab reigned for 20 years, Ahaziah reigned for 1, and Jehoram reigned for 10. And when you add those up, it's 42. So they're saying with that reign of, of the kings, that's where the 42 is coming from with God lumping Ahaziah in with those wicked kings in their reign, using that number to tie it in. Um, it says that Amri of Israel began to reign in, uh, in the year 3181 uh, after creation, timelining it from creation, Ahaziah of Judah began to reign 3231 after creation, which is 42 years difference between Amri and Ahaziah. Um, then, then he does some more numbers here with the, adding up to the same thing with, the, with Amri, Ahab, Ahaziah, and Jehoram. So... Their conclusion is, you know, was it a contradiction? No, it was God. It was how God told Bible believers he counted Ahaziah among the wicked kings of Israel and not among the kings of Judah. So they would know why Jehu killed him when cutting off the house of Ahab. Was it a contradiction? No, it was how God told Bible believers he counted Ahaziah among the wicked kings of Israel and not among the kings of Judah. So they would know why he removed Ahaziah, his son, and his grandson from the lineage of Jesus Christ. So was it a contradiction? No, it was to test whether men believed God and his word or the research of textual critics, commentators, and seminary professors. As Jesus' glory has thanked his father, uh, God has hid such things from the wise and proven and revealed them unto babes. Um, and then he says it was how God showed any Bible with 22 in that passage is not his word. So um, th this is what th this person is saying. And then, and then he gives further evidence of does the Bible count years from other political events? Basically, does this happen anywhere else? Or is it just w this one place and solely exclusively here? And it gives a few examples here of... Um, from 1 Kings 16 versus 2 Chronicles 16 of Baasha, the king of Israel, when he fought against Asa, king of Judah. So in 1 Kings 16, verses 6 through 8, I'm, I'm just going to read this quote. I'm not, I don't have, I'm not turning there. The Bible says, or the, this quote says, So Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried in Tirzah, and Elah's son reigned in his stead. And it's a dot, dot, dot. In the 20 and 6th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Tirzah two years. And then in, in uh, 2 Chronicles 16, the Bible says in the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa. So the first one said the 26th year of Asa. The other one says the 6th and 30th year of Asa. Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah. And uh, to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So... Asa's reign is counted from the divided kingdom, is what this is saying. When Rehoboam lost ten tribes of Jeroboam, Baasha came up against Asa in the 36th year of the kingdom of Judah. So it says Rehoboam reigned, you know, reigned 17 years, Abijam 3, and Asa 16 for a total of 36. So, um, and, and the other point about that too, it says in the 26th year of Asa, that's when Baasha died in the 26th year of Asa. And then it says in the 36th year of Asa is when Baasha came up against Israel. So you're saying like he's already been dead for 10 years. How could he go up against him? And that's, again, another supposed contradiction that they brought up saying, no, the time was actually measured from a different political event 
not from um, what, you're, what you may be thinking that the time is starting from. So, um, and then he brings up another example. I don't want to go through all that right now. We've kind of gone uh, uh, for quite a while now. I could give you the rest of these notes if you're interested in looking at it. Now, that last one, like I said, that's a puzzle. But my faith is not shaken at all in God's word. There has been, I have looked at, this is the first time, and, and you know, normally I wouldn't do this with, you know, with, with preaching something I'm not sure about or, or don't feel you know, confident in, but I'm confident in God's word. Amen. And there is, it, it, there is a lot, the reason why I added that one in because there's a lot of interesting stuff there that I had never looked at before but looks, I mean, looks right on. And a lot of, it, at the very least, very interesting things that are, that are being added up there when you see that Ahaziah is not included in, the in Matthew chapter 1. You see that Ahaziah does have this, this kind of almost dual lineage between the house of Judah and the house of Israel, between the good and the evil. So like he's kind of gone through on this evil path. And what does that number 42 mean versus the 22? Very, very interesting stuff. But um, what it boils down to is, and at the end of the day, you have to, as I mentioned this morning, our salvation is based on our faith. You either believe or you don't. Jesus Christ was the Word made flesh. You either believe on Him or you don't. God's Word is promised to be preserved for us, generation to generation. It either has or it hasn't. You believe it or you don't. You want to find a reason not to believe, you'll find a reason not to believe. Right. Mm -hmm. But for those of us that do believe, I don't, this doesn't need to shake your faith. There is a good reason for this. Whether we could wrap our minds around every single thing, every single aspect or every mystery that we might come across in the Bible does not make it invalid or not the truth. That's right. Even simple numbers can have a deeper meaning. Exactly. Amen. And we saw that tonight. There are simple numbers that have a much deeper meaning and it's based on how you look at it. It's based on, you know, you got to understand the perspective. There's a lot of things you have to understand what's going on behind these numbers. So there are so many things. The Bible is so deep. It's immensely deep. Praise God for his truth and his wisdom. And I pray that we would all just, just gain some more wisdom. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would please help us not to be shaken in our own faith when um, people will want to attack your word as has been happening all throughout history, dear Lord. People wanting to question what you say, question do we have the word of God. Um, God, just as, as Jesus gave parables unto the people, and the Bible literally says so that seeing they might see and not perceive, and hearing they might hear and not understand, there are people that they just don't want to believe. And you talk to them in parables and, and you know they're not going to... They're not going to get it. But there's, there's other people that want to attack your word and just say, they, because they don't want to believe, because they're going to try to find any possible reason to, to disprove your word as being true. But Lord, we here have accepted your word. We believe it. We believe it to be true. Uh, just as much as we put our faith in Jesus Christ for the salvation of our souls, Lord. Pray that you would please though, uh, help us to understand these, these areas, especially when there's areas like this that um, there is a reason for it. Help us understand the reason for these things. Help us not to get caught up on it, but that you would just open up our understanding so that we could just have that much more knowledge and wisdom, dear Lord, and we could share it with others so that other people wouldn't have their faith shaken either, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.